She is the CEO of Women's Choice. She's an author, she's an impactor, she's an influencer. I only do one thing, I empower yeah. women. But it feels good though, doesn't it? When someone says you can't do it. It has. And it just feels it really good. I can tell you something that is very surprising. The US can be very backward when it comes to women in corporations. Your story is, is amazing, frankly. Women came to the workforce much later than men. Word, I know, no, no, okay, no, no, I'm okay. not doing right. the safe word. I think middle school is very boring. I still wake it. up every now and again yes. sweating about algebra lessons. I was not Bill Gates. I just created a structure. When you were giving uh, French lessons? No, 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 no. <laughs> like, oh my God, this is amazing. Great idea, but we don't have any budget. I'm sure, like, you don't know who I'm talking about, but you're going to be surprised. Women empowerment or women in power? It's not easy to really find out who you want to be. Hello everyone and welcome to the Inside Track with me, Luca Alam. I am delighted to welcome Nessa Alawi. She is the CEO of Women's Choice. She's an author, she's an impactor, she's an influencer, and she has a huge following on Instagram. Nessa, welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you feeling this morning? Great. Fantastic. I see you brought something with you. What have you brought with you? I did. Well, you asked me to bring my coffee mug. I actually don't drink coffee. Okay. So it's my smoothie with some mix of a lot of green things and a lot of blueberry. That's why the color. Very nice. Very healthy mm -hmm. start to the morning. Yes, exactly. Do you, have, do you have a shake most mornings? I do. Yeah? Good yes. way to start the day, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And, and can you tell like, people who are watching uh, and listening a little bit about yourself? So, you know, because you do a lot of different things and you've been doing them for quite some time and your story is, is amazing, frankly. So it would be great to get a little bit of an understanding from yourself. Thank you. It's funny that you say that I do a lot of things. I, I hear that a lot, but I feel like I only do one thing. I empower yeah. women the whole day. So, but I do that through different things. Um, I've been, I've launched my career uh, with the United Nations in 2011, and since then I've been producing small, medium, and large social project focused on women's empowerment. I call myself a social innovator. I um, actually forgot to tell you to add that to the tagline, um, because I'm always constantly looking for um, the most innovative way to create impact. Nice, nice. So how did you get into the United Nations at the beginning? Like how, talk to me a little bit about when you were younger, did you always want to do this? Did it, was it a calling that you had? I'd love to understand sure, that. Sure, sure. I mean, I should have brought my book because the story is there and I would have uh, showed it to, to our audience. Well, um, it was a little girl's dream. I dreamt about working for the United Nations when I was seven years old. And then um, moving forward, I did a hotel management school, business school, then uh, launched myself as an entrepreneur at the age of 24. And uh, by 27, I had 12 stores in Morocco, brought oh, wow. some, as you are in advertising, brought some brands from the US to Morocco with a plan to uh, expand uh, all over North Africa. And uh, yeah, so I had the 12 stores, four brands. And uh, actually decided to really reconsider my life. I was already a mother of two. Um, I think I had ticked a lot of boxes when it comes to being successful yeah. uh, as a woman, the husband, the kids, you know, the business and uh, the education. And, and I just thought that if I could do and succeed all that at the age of 27, yeah. then I had much more to bring to the world for the rest of my life. So I went into really looking back at who did I want to be when I was seven years old. And I think that at seven years old, we're pretty clear about who we want to be. And it's much later in life that we get confused because we need to uh, fit the format of what education gives us, our families and society. And uh, yeah, so I, I was lucky enough to do at 27 a shift that women do at 40 or 50. So that definitely saved me time. Yeah. 
And um, but it's almost like you lived a, a, almost a full life up until the age of 27, right? So uh, totally. what you've accomplished in that mm -hmm. age, up to that age, was what a lot of people take, what, 30, 40, 50 years to accomplish. I'm, I am a, a hyperactive person, so I must admit that uh, um, I'm a doer. I like my thinking is, is fast between thinking, intuition, thinking, and then putting in place an actionable plan. And uh, when I made that shift at the age of 27, now I'm 40, so for the past 13 years, uh, I've continued uh, achieving with, with purpose. Yeah. So if somebody asks you, very simple question, what do you do? How do you, how do, what's your initial first reaction? To that I question? think what's in my DNA, it's creating impact. And uh, I focused on creating impact among women because I think women are the mothers of the next generation. And uh, I've made a lot of research. Uh, I've been on the field all over Africa for the United Nations. So first of all, when I did the United Nations, it was for the World Food Program. So it's mm. a multi-gender program yep. for hunger. And uh, when I was in Ethiopia, Mozambique, Senegal, Haiti, well, 90% of the, 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 the beneficiaries were women. Yeah. So uh, poverty touches women. And when you create impact on women, even at a very, very low um, social level, they always give back to the community. Yeah. They always educate their kids, um, give back to the community at so many levels. Is there a particular memory that stands out for you when you visited all these different communities around the world and so you know, wow, this is this is something that just, you know, it resonates with you, it stays with you, and you'll you'll never forget. Is that a particular story that you have? Definitely. Well, it was in 2011, and, and I think this women's empowerment journey was, it was really at the beginning of it, because things accelerated in the U.S. with the hashtag Me Too, um, and, and, you know, here in the region as well uh, later. So 2011... You're, you're, you are on the field, you're meeting very poor women that are struggling with hunger, HIV, um, and, and so many other, I mean, gender-based violence and so on. And, and my story is that these women were really strong. They were really powerful. And I had something to bring back to the, the more developed world in terms of stories of these women. Yeah. They were warriors, they were positive, they were, they were content, um, they were very productive, very proud of their productivity as, as cooperatives. But of course they were ch struggling with the financial challenges. Yeah. And um, that's why when I came back and I created my own foundation in 2014, the Meshad Foundation, and I'll tell you why Meshad, and on my Instagram it's Meshad Women, um, the, the, my focus was women's financial independence because I think if you enable them with financial independence, they're smart. Yeah. They'll know how to make the right choices for themselves. Um, and, you know, this is, I feel like when you meet some of these women, um, you must have been inspired yourself by some of their stories, their determination. Does it sort of it fuel you? Does it empower you further to do this again? Because you see how incredible that they are. And they just, again, like I said, it inspires you to want to do more. Yes, definitely. I think to 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 succeed a lasting um, social entrepreneurial journey because it's not uh, it's not always easy. Um, yes, you need to have the humility first of all to learn from from everyone because if you just come as a giver, um, sometimes you give, sometimes you don't have anything to give because you're facing a challenge yourself. Yeah. But uh, if throughout that journey you learn, you get inspired you give, you share, then you're always fed by the journey. So before we go any further, I always give my guests an opportunity to, to have a safe word, right? So if there's a certain question, if I delve a bit too deep and there's somewhere you don't want to go, um, you can use a safe word. So do you have a safe word in mind that you want to use? Well, I think I'm going to use Meshad, which is my Meshad. brand. Brilliant. Look at and, that. Fantastic. Um, okay. I love it. <laughs> um, and you mentioned advertising before. Again, one of the other things I always ask, because I work in the industry, um, do you have a particular favorite brand? Uh, and, and if so, what is it about that brand that you love so much? Sure. I have I a have few favorite brands and, and I have brands that I hate because, because of the, not of the quality, their luxury brand, but a little bit what they stand out for. They just became like mass luxury brands that I'm not going to name. 
So, so yes, yeah, so the brands that I love in terms of fashion is Max Mara, um, the Italian brand, because it's just so elegant. I love Eres, the, the, the swimwear brand, and it's a legacy in my family. My mom used to wear it. I, I wore it. My daughters wear it. Nice. And lately, for March 8, they actually featured me as a, one of their 36 global ambassadors. Wow. Your daughters, sorry, they're, they're teenagers now, right? Yes. They're 13 and 15, okay. and the 15 years old one, you know, feels like she's 18 or, two, or 18. Um, yeah, so that's two fashion brands. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about a brand that um, I've been uh, working with and that I'm really, really, really like touched by. It's MasterCard. Um, they're the ones sponsoring the pilot of my social innovation incubator. Um, they featured me in their legacy book and, uh, and, and I'm working with them and I'm really discovering an amazing um, equity culture yeah. within the brand. And it's not just like at a show off stage, it's really embedded inside. Um, I think that the, what you're trying to do now, there's obviously a lot of other people trying to do something very similar. Um, I think, you're, do you have a unique approach to how you talk about women empowerment? Is there something a little bit different to your approach, your style, uh, to how you get your message across versus other, other ladies sure. out there? Sure. No, first of all, I would like to congratulate everyone that does this because when we look at the numbers, really like the, the statistic and the numbers when it comes to uh, equal pay, when it comes to funding for women, when it comes to... Uh, women out of poverty, the numbers are still very, very low. So we do need a lot of people. It's not a crowded place yeah. as much as it seems like a crowded place sometimes. Um, yeah, so my approach has always been, first of all, like I started a long time ago, really like in this field, a lot has been happening over the past three to five years. So uh, so I started a long time ago, so I, I, I could really, really like become an expert yeah. in the field. The second thing is I do go on the field. So I'm not just sitting in conferences and, and talking active, about, I'm back active, to hyper, exactly. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm active and for a long time before moving to New York, I was imposing myself to be on the field somewhere in Africa every two months. Yeah. Because you, you get easily trapped in being invited all over the world to speak at conferences and I never wanted to touch base with the reality. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so, so my unique thing is, is, is I'm a doer. I'm a doer, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I know how to also link impact to marketing and, and business development because it's important for the big brands that support us. 100%. Do you think there's a, is there a part of the world that's a little bit more advanced when it comes to women empowerment? Do you think, you know, you mentioned you obviously yeah. lived in New York um, and you've obviously traveled to Africa and you've mm. been around the Middle East. Is there a certain place that you feel is a little bit more advanced than the rest of the world? Well, I'll tell you something. I've, I've worked, as you said, in, in Africa, North Africa, uh, Europe as well, in, in France, uh, the US, and here in Middle East. And I can tell you something that is very surprising. The US can be very backward when it comes to, to women in corporations. Uh, they've gone through a huge struggle uh, so there we really speak about diversity and inclusion at large, race problems, yeah. age pro discriminations. I mean, the discrimination is at all levels. The, the stereotype of the white male uh, guy that just breaks the ceiling is, is a reality. So, so yeah, so there isn't a place that is more advanced. There is a common thread to, to women challenges uh, across the globe. Uh, there are particular uh, uh, social uh, problems that are different from one place to another. But um, I mean, this yeah. part of the world, when we're talking about women at the top, is, is much more advanced, for instance, than, yeah. than the US. Uh, what is it the feeling that you have? Is it, is it anger that you, when, you, when you see or hear these things? Is it frustration? Is it sadness? Talk to me a little bit about your emotions when you, when sure. you see these types of stories. It's, well, I, I think what also took me through this, this journey and also made me um, get, get the proper partnerships throughout the journey. It's definitely that I was not on an angry mode. 
I was on a very realistic, okay, that, that's the case. I'm not angry at anyone. And definitely what, what made me empower myself is that I'm very comfortable around men. Uh, growing up, my, my best friends were boys because I had an older brother. And, and I could always, I, I never saw my, my, uh, my own gender limits, even though I was born African, Muslim, Arab women, so you know, the, with like all this uh, a minority uh, ticking the box, you know, you could have a lot of challenges. But but um, no, so definitely no anger. Definitely a lot of uh, working with men over over this. I think just just accepting the reality. The reality is women came to the workforce much later than men. And there are historical reasons yeah. uh, why they came to the workforce. So obviously, I think we have to do it with, with humility and, and men have to support this, uh, um, this journey without feeling fear or angry or, or um, frustrated yeah. themselves because we're just advancing society. So w was there something in particular that happened when you were a bit younger in your formative years that made you realize that this matters so much to you. This is such an important topic for you to try and change perceptions, you know, give opportunities. Was there a specific thing that happened when you were younger? Sure, sure. Well, um, as I told you, I, w I was empowered myself because I grew up in, in a male environment and, and even my mother, when I remember her, was, was very, uh, a little bit like tomboyish and, you know, she was riding bikes in, in Morocco in the, in the 80s, wearing jeans and, so, so I was lucky to grow up in an environment where there it was the both genders were were really like um, living peacefully and and empowering each other. So that gave me a little bit uh, the the power to feel that I have to to give back to to women that didn't have that opportunity. But uh, talking about my childhood, as long as I remember myself, I was a social innovator, and I'll tell you how. So here I am, like, I think five, six years old, and uh, we lived in Rabat, the capital, where I was going to a private French school, and then on the weekend, we would go to Marrakech. Uh, my dad had a passion for agriculture, so we were in a farm. So I was spending my weekend with the kids of farmers, and, uh, and, and I'm like a five, six, seven-year-old child who, who doesn't have anything to give, yet I found that I had something to give. I spoke French and I was studying like boring French during the whole week, which was something that they didn't have. So I would spend the weekend teaching them French. Amazing. So and that's how you boys create. and girls? Or? Yeah, boys and girls, yeah. boys and girls. And uh, and so that that's a little bit, you know, like how... Uh, Giving you, back almost. Yeah, right? and, and build, you know, like your impact journey. You always, I think a lot of people are intimidated by creating impact because they always feel they don't have enough. Yeah. Uh, I created the foundation in 2014. I was not Bill Gates, you know, yeah, like uh, yeah, yeah. I just created a structure, yeah. a shell that is well structured to actually receive funds, to, to advocate for projects. And so, so yeah, so I always had that, uh, for me, impact was very simple. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder what words you were teaching them. And I, yes. and I wonder if they still remember them. <laughs> um, so talk to me a little bit about your daughters, because obviously you mentioned your mom yes. as well. Um, wh what's, what's your message to your, to your kids? How, how are you raising them? And, you know, what is, the, what is, is there a right way, if you like, when it comes to trying to inspire the next generation? Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so first of all, Meshad, um, my brand. Is that your, is that, okay, is that yes, wasn't your safe that's word. that's Meshad. You're Shadin. not doing a safe word. I know, no, okay, no, 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 I'm okay. not doing right. the safe word. Well, it's the first syllabus of the names of my daughters, okay. Mesun and Shadin. Beautiful. And uh, and I, I was I was lucky to be a young mom, yeah. so I almost feel like they grew up with me, and uh, I'm very close to them. Um, yes. So so my message to them is, and which has always been, you lead by example, and um, so always. Um, push yourself to do things the right way because otherwise you, you you cannot inspire others, you cannot dictate to others to act in a certain way. Uh, be ambitious. They 
the way I, I think middle school is very boring. <laughs> I remember <laughs> it like if it was yesterday. No one likes school that much. No, <laughs> and middle school, you know, because at the beginning you learn like elementary things, which is like writing, you know, like calculating that you will use all your life. But then middle school becomes very, very boring because they teach you theoretical things that you start questioning, like, am I going to ever use that in my yeah. life? Yeah. But you have to go I through it. I still wake up every now and again yes. sweating about algebra lessons and realizing, <laughs> like, you know, I used to I used to hate maths at school. Yeah. It, was like, it was the one thing I couldn't do. And uh, I always, I, I said to myself at the time, thinking exactly what you're saying, will I ever use yeah. algebra again in my and life? That, yeah, I mean, you grow up but and you realize part, it was a scam. It's part of that process, exactly. right? It's all part of that process. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so my daughters are very independent in, in, you know, getting good grades and managing um, their, their school. But that's because I built an ambitious goal for them to actually go to Harvard school, one yeah. to be a lawyer, the other one to become a doctor. And you and went to Harvard, right? You did a couple yes, of years. Uh, yes, I, I've been going for an annual executive course. And and so, so yeah, so that that's what I teach them is like have a big vision because yeah. it will help you through the small challenges of yeah. the day-to-day -day life. Really nice. So um, I, have, I have what's called my bag of balls, right? I, inside the bag, there are different mm -hmm. topics relating to, to a little bit about what we've talked about. Um, and we're going to do a bit of improv, right? So you have no mm -hmm. idea. You've never seen what's in here, right? No. You never. You have no, no idea no, what's no. in here. Exactly. So you're going to pick a ball out and then we'll have a little conversation okay. about it. Sound good? That's great. Yeah? All right. <laughs> yeah, nicely branded as well. There yeah. you go. You see? I like that. Fantastic. All right. So let me see what we got first. Okay. Biggest challenge you faced. What's your biggest challenge you've ever faced? Biggest challenge I faced? I think, yes. I think uh, when I was 27 and I really wanted to change completely my right, go to impact, live, uh, live a very comfortable life that I had built for myself. Yes, I think it was, it was the moment. First of all, it was my first big decision that I made in my life. So I'm sure I faced bigger challenges after, but I don't remember them because that's it, you know. Once you do it once and you know that people tell you, no, 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 you're not going to succeed it, but you succeeded, then, then you know, like you, you just have that confidence. But in it you. feels good though, doesn't it? When someone says you can't do it. It does. And it just feels it does. really good. It does. It? Yeah. But, but really at 40 years old, the one that I remember the most was that first one that I made. And, uh, and yes, and I did it. And actually, you, you asked me the question about the United Nations. Well, my first uh, big project was, okay, I had a dream. And that dream was to work for the United Nations. So I have to make it happen. How do I do? Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, like I, I planned it. I went into um, finding the project, negotiating for six months, um, and getting it, even though I was not the most experienced person in the field, but I think back then they saw my level of motivation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and you started off in the United Nations. Where was it? Uh, it was it was uh, at the World Food Program that well, is headquartered we, in Rome. Okay, so you were in Rome at the time. Okay, I was not in Rome. I was on the field. They sent me on the okay. field. So my negotiation was with the office in Rome. But okay. then after I went to Mozambique, Ethiopia. Um, Senegal, Mauritania, and Haiti. Yeah, that's crazy. So, how old were you when you faced this challenge? The first, the first one, would you say? I was twenty-seven. You were twenty-seven, and that, I, that seems to be the age where everything seems to have happened, right? So, yes. Yeah, it's almost like you have a watershed moment exactly. in, in your life. And before that, did you face any smaller little challenges before uh, you? Well, joined the United Nations? No, I mean, of course, you know, you, you go through personal challenges. My parents divorced when I was uh, six, seven years old. Uh, it wasn't a common thing in Morocco. So yeah. it was, you know, like being thrown in the unknown. And I remember facing it with, um, again, a lot of positivity and trying to rationalize, asking both of my parents, like, what's happening like are you still gonna love me yes and yeah. you are you still gonna love me yes am i still gonna see both of you yes well then great then i, I guess i'm happy yeah. and do you have <laughs> and brothers and sisters yes i have an older brother okay. and then 
I mean, that was the most beautiful thing because after both of my parents remarried and I have my, my little brothers and sisters on both sides. Very nice. Very so, nice. Um, Are you still close with your brother? Very close, yeah, yeah to all of them. Yeah, fantastic. Do you want to pick the next ball? Sure. They get harder, by the way. Okay. They get harder. <laughs> this is the warm-up round. So best advice you've heard. So yes. what's the best piece of advice you've ever heard? Again, you know, a lot of challenges, a lot of advices, but there is always one that stands out. Um, yes, and I remember it was during that same time. When you were giving uh, French lessons? <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, when, when I was making the change, or maybe like a little later further, and uh, it's uh, this friend who actually is very wise, a lot into yoga. He's a male friend, but is into, you know, like all this wellness, spiritual yeah. things. And he told me, he said, at a moment where I, 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 you know, like I was feeling a little bit angry over people being intrusive in my life and who to actually take off from my life or not. And he said, Neza, don't judge people. Observe yourself and keep observing yourself and just like keep what feels right for you. And uh, this is a very wise piece because in reality, if you keep judging people when, when an interaction is not right, you're giving a lot of energy into that that you shouldn't spend on it. And the second thing is it's not that someone is right or wrong or it's just keep observing you and what makes you feel right. Yeah. You can have like a very, a great person in front of you, but it just doesn't feel right for you at that specific time in your life. I love that, I love that. And uh, yeah, and so it, it really kind of like helped me step back after, whether in my personal relationships or uh, professional, and, and it freed me. And you're still doing it now, you're still observing yes. yourself. We, we have this habit, don't we? We judge very quickly as humans. Yes. And uh, yes. we also, we prejudge. So you hear about someone before yes. you even meet them. Um, and you think you start to form an opinion. You put them in a box because it makes sure. you feel comfortable. But actually when you meet them for the first time, yeah. you may have to change your mind. Um, but we're very easily influenced by all these different exterior motives. And uh, it's actually quite sad because mm. one of the reasons why I wanted to do this show was to understand the actual the real person and who they are um, and sort of uncover. So there's so, certain stereotypes that are out there that, you know, I think the more you shine a light on, you'll be able to smash them. Um, mm -hmm. And and I'm really happy, actually, that we can talk about this now. Time for another Thank ball. Thank you. Time for another ball. Do you want me to do it? Or you actually would pick another one. You're on a I'll roll. Pick another, pick another one. one. Exactly. You're on a roll. Solidarity or personal branding? Okay, so what do I mean by this? Yes. Is it more important um, for you to sort of work on, on your personal brand and to stand out? Mm -hmm. Or is it more important for you to work with others, right? And in solidarity to start changing things? Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. No, totally. I've, uh, I'm very happy to see that the world is really... Um, we are in an era of partnerships. You see it among big brands. You see it among people, everyone is open and seeking partnerships. It wasn't the case just 10 years ago. I've always been a partnership person. And, uh, and uh, even throughout my journey, I could have been a consultant with no one around me. And, uh, but I've always developed teams around me. I think it was my way of, uh, yeah, I, I need to share with people. Uh, but this said, I do encourage people to build their personal branding. I have built my personal branding throughout that journey because you need to be strong and clear about who you are to be an anchor to be able to to have to, to to give back to more people around you because when you are a generous and sharing person you want to drive people with you yeah. to success but for that you need to build your personal branding. Yeah, it's about again you go back to impact. You like you love to create impact. You yeah. create more impact by becoming this face, a this person, brand. Yeah. or do you create more impact by working with others to help drive and change agendas? Well, the thing is now I'm, I'm all about, you know, like sharing the stage and, and really putting more women that are empowered into what I do. But uh, at the beginning of it, I there is a lot that I had to do on my own because no one would be as crazy to actually <laughs> follow, you know, the projects that, that I was doing. So... 
So yeah, so so I think there is a time when you're really innovative in what you're doing. I, I'm really talking about me like knocking at doors in 2011, 12, 13, talking about gender equity to corporations. And they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Great idea, but we don't have any budget for yeah, it. it goes and in it's and not it goes exactly. And then two years, three years later, them calling me and saying, oh, by the way, what you were saying, yeah. because the, the sustainable development goals and the agenda for 2030 launched in 2015. Yeah. So from 2011 to 2015, there, there, there was nothing within corporation structure to, to create impact. Apart from, you know, again, Bill Gates and, and Melinda that went all the way to the top and decided to share. But after 2015, it, it really started because, the, I mean, the whole goal of this Agenda 2030 is to bring corporations, institutions and government to make them responsible through impact. Do you think the corporations are doing this because they feel they have to do it or because they want to do it? Well, at first, and, and again, when you talked about feelings and anger, I, I was the type of person... So, like I know some people in the social field who were like, yeah, they're so fake. They're just doing it for the marketing and everything. And I was like, I I'll take the marketing yeah. budget. I'm fine. You know, yeah. you have to start somewhere. Yeah. I understand they were doing it for the marketing at the beginning. But then this is how you start building a culture within yeah. the corporation. The ends justify the means. So it doesn't exactly. really matter how you totally. get as long as you get that, right? Uh, that's very interesting. And was there... A because we talked about it in inspirational and making impact. Is there a, is there a woman out there or previously um, that you've always looked up to and been inspired by? Is there a particular name that comes to mind? Sure. As we're here in the region, I'll talk about uh, a social entrepreneur that uh, has really been doing uh, projects and leading projects with being on the field and 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 like having a continuous vision. And she's a real leader. And I'm sure, like, you don't know who I'm talking about, but you're going to be surprised. I'll look her it's, up if I don't. It's, no, you, you will know who, who she is when I say it. It's uh, Sheikha Moza. Okay. That woman, I had the chance to meet her, to work uh, with her foundations on projects. Nice. She has created, and, and I relate to her because she's, she's a woman at the top who really went on on building like a massive infra impact infrastructure as a social entrepreneur. What was she like as what a person? She, as a person, she's, she has a fantastic energy. Um, very nice, very humble and uh, very refined. Yeah. Very refined, like doesn't wear, you know, like a lot of jewelry. She can have like just a little, very like thin bracelet. So very, very refined and fashionable. And uh, and a leader, and she's she's close. She always recruits young talents. She empowers them. She's close to them. So she's really close to to her action plan. Amazing. Uh, time for another ball. Do you want to pass over the bank to sure. me? You enjoying this, by the yes. way? Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see what we have here. So this one is uh, okay because I know you do a lot of presenting, right? Um, present to a few or present to many. Is it easier, harder to have an auditorium filled with, let's say, two or three people or 500, 600 people? Talk to me a little about how you present um, and what's easier for you and give us some tips, if you can, as well, about your presentational sure. style. Well, um, I think if I could grow a massive um, audience on social media, it's, it's definitely because I've always been... Uh, very comfortable talking as much to one person or a thousand people. Okay. Um, I think that when you speak, really, like even to one person, you you need to to speak with the same authenticity as if you're speaking to a million people that can actually go and research and try to validate if what you're mm. saying is true or not. Mm. Uh, the second thing is I I never want to know the questions when I go on TV or, you know, when I'm being questioned yeah, in a yeah. podcast yeah. like that, because I think it loses the authenticity. Yeah. And, uh, and yes, w I mean, you become a better and better presenter when you're aligned with, with who you are. Uh, and, uh, and y you become a better media trained person when, when you, you're coherent. You what, know, if, what if someone asks you a question? Sure. And Ask me the hardest question Yeah, but question what if they ask ever. you a question and you just, 
you, you don't know how to do you ever have that we just don't know how to re react sure. or respond what do you do in those situations i think in that situation i pause like i look like i'm thinking yeah. and i just think i take You're the buying time. time exactly You're buying time. Yeah, yeah. no but i mean i i just think i'm not a robot so yeah. obviously if you're asking me a question and you want me to answer authentically I will have that time to pause and, and think. Yeah. So. And uh, how often do you think people are being authentic when they're on camera or when they're off camera? Yeah, well, I think, I don't know why they have this perception that on camera, you should not be authentic. Like you have to be prepared. You have to. And, and that's where the stress comes from. Yeah. And I think I was just not intimidated uh, throughout my life of uh, being in front of the camera and uh and the other thing on social media so first of all i have a tiktok mug because um tiktok the brand offered it to me are you to on try tiktok to are you on tiktok <laughs> no i'm not to try to onboard me on tiktok but i'm I, i'm actually too comfortable on instagram to make the shift at this stage uh i think instagram right now is is already overcrowded with the with content creators so definitely if you're starting your social media journey you should be on tiktok <laughs> But when I started 15 years ago, it wasn't that crowded. Yeah. And, uh, and, so, and I love photography. I've been a photographer as well in a past life. Wow. So I have published books in photography. Done, yeah. no. Writing books, <laughs> yes. presenting, TV shows, <laughs> all that stuff. Fantastic. And so, yes. Yeah, so, so the thing about social media and, and back to being comfortable with one or a thousand people, I've, I've always posted my pictures when I had one follower, like if there was a million followers. So it didn't bother you? No. All that, whether you get amazing engagement or not, you're, no. just, you're just being yourself. Exactly. And is that why you have a very famous tagline? What is your tagline that you, you always use? Be who you want to be. Be who you want yes. to be. Yes. Be who you want to be is, is for me something very, very like strong on point. And when I had to look for a tagline, I was like, be who you want to be because it's not easy. Yeah. to really find out who you want to be. Yeah. I think one of the hardest things for, for, for everyone is to really figure out who they really want to be, not who their neighbor inspired them to be because, you know, he has a Porsche uh, in the garage, not who their parents told them to be, not who, you know, their friends, successful friends uh, are inspiring them to be, but who they really want to be. And I think that's an exercise that you really need to do at first to find your own path and journey, and then you'll you'll be successful at it. Yeah, does it go back to maybe the advice that you heard from your friend saying, just observe yourself, right? So if you observe yes. yourself, it starts with you. Definitely. And really understanding who you are. So don't focus about anybody else. Yes. Stop pointing fingers Completely. elsewhere, but just point at yourself and say, you know, who am I? What am I, what do I really care about? Um, so being authentic is what matters most, whether you're presenting to one person or, or sure. a thousand people. Um, and you can always answer questions because, and you're not phased by it because, again, if you're being yourself and you're being real and be who you want to be, that's, uh, it's easy. Exactly. Very good. Nice. Mm -hmm. Next ball. If this one says, oh, I like this one. Mm -hmm. uh, women empowerment or women in power? Both. Well, you got to choose. But I'll tell you why <laughs> I'm, I'm going to push for you. Okay. Women in power at a high social level. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, as I said, women give back, they have, they have a compassionate leadership and, um, and actually I'm, I'm presenting, uh, I'm launching the social innovation incubator in, in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and there is a man that I'm interviewing that has been empowered by women all his, his life. And so... So yes, yeah, so 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 women would empower back, especially like if you put them in a sort of like level of confidence and so on, they will empower back both. But can genders. you create more impact to challenge you? Can you make more impact if you're in power? Right? No, but then, then the second thing is the world needs to be empowered. So I'm I'm talking about, you know, the women at the top, women in power. Yeah. And so from top down, but then you a lot of the majority needs to be empowered. Okay. So, so yes, no, empowering women is important, but don't forget also to create a sort of community at the top to create more impact. Because if you're just alone as a powerful woman, empowering women, 
the the limit of your impact is limited to yes. your life and i'm very ambitious so <laughs> <laughs> my life is not enough i need you know like to unroll more yeah. women at a power level to to create more impact so can you define because a lot of i've asked this question to a few people and can you define what is women empowerment what does that actually mean to you it's enabling women with uh with different things that they need you know some like skills uh skills development learning it's an ongoing journey and uh and then resources um yes because the the means are important to be able to to succeed whatever they're doing and partnerships and actually that's what the SII for women's empl employment is 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 going to give and again it's the story of we're empowering a million women by placing them in jobs but we're also enabling and empowering a thousand high level social entrepreneurs by giving them the skills the resources and the partnerships to be able to succeed mm. so i've always looked at at both level and i think it's important to be able to really succeed something that is consistent and that runs behind you like behind your existence yeah and how important are men in this equation driving the agenda of women empowerment completely totally i mean they they're part of of the equation at 200% and uh they 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 have the, the question is not to create when we talk about dei which is diversity equity and inclusion it started with diversity then inclusion then diversity equity and inclusion because because again in when you're creating impact you always need to make sure to uh not have like bad consequences of the impact that you're creating yeah. so i think it's very important to to include men in the journey so, and and your husband talk to yes. me a little bit about your husband yes 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 well um my husband is the love of look my how, life because look how your like face lights up know. look how your face yes, lights up fantastic yes. what's um, his what's his name your husband pierre paolo fantastic he's italian I'm he's telling. italian he's italian he's not the father of my kids so i met the father of my kids when i was 15 we're very close he's like he's you know my life partner yeah. so we have an amazing uh, relationship and he loves pierre paolo and and likewise and uh, yes pierre paolo i met a couple of years ago so it's it's you know the yeah. The, the chosen relationship that you choose at a later age in your at a later stage in your life when you are accomplished and you're looking for an equal partner to to build on uh, the, the the second phase in your life you know because uh i i think 40 is the new 20 or you know like 50 yes. is the new 30 for for all of us so um so let's say i'm talking to pier paolo now and i ask yes. him about you right how would he describe you to me <laughs> well i he would describe you as a woman that wakes up in the morning with the uh, with 10000 ideas it's like literally i would wake up and would be like my love so i have this idea <laughs> that was and he's like were you dreaming about this this ideas yeah, throughout yeah. the night yeah, yeah. so so it and, reminds me very much of my wife okay <laughs> so uh and uh and then also the the women who at night after having achieved a lot of things at, at different levels personal family and so on will just put her head on the on the 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 pillow and and like sleep peacefully when he's still kind of like yeah. trying to look for for his sleep so um yes they used to always say there's a, uh, behind every great man there's a great woman right and in your case it seems to be behind every great woman yes a great man. yes Is no i i i think it applies to both yeah. definitely amazing and uh, time for another ball what do you think I'm, sure. I'm gonna hand it back to you how many do we have left i think we've got one or we've got two we've got two left okay leaders born versus made okay uh, it's very simple yes are leaders born or are they made well, in, in my book, Be Who You Want to Be, Be a Leader, the first chapter is leadership, a concept or reality, where we're dem demystifying this word that is so commonly used, which is what is leadership. And so back to this question, born or made, well, I think some were lucky to be born leaders because, you know, they were in an environment of leadership uh, within their family not I wouldn't say born but like grew up yeah. in leadership um, in the leadership uh, values 
But uh, but definitely we can we can build ourselves as a leader. And actually, it's not something that you take for granted. As I said, you know, you can have grown up in an environment of leadership values, but you need to always keep working on it. So what does make a good leader? Um, okay, so a good leader. So I would say a compassionate leader, compassion, authenticity, and uh, finding out who you want to be and and then like how you want to inspire yeah. because you're a leader throughout your own journey. You need to inspire others to to actually onboard on your journey or or want to to learn from your journey. So so yes, yeah, so you you can be a leader in everything. Yeah. I'm an awful singer for instance. Pierre Paolo like sings and plays guitar and yeah. and I'm an awful singer, but I tell him I'm a great dancer. So, so you have a lot so in common with my wife. Have you have a lot in common with my wife. <laughs> okay. By the way. You don't want to hear her sing, <laughs> no. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> Very nice. So, so yeah, so that's, that's the thing, you know, don't, don't try to be a leader in everything. I think at the core, be compassionate and authentic because yeah. it's important through life. And then just and people find see that, own. right? They yeah. see that when they see a leader who's genuine and, and being yeah. themselves and not acting in a certain role because they feel like they have to. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what draws people to them. You know, it's that emotive concept. Um, I, I also believe that the circumstance around can also dictate, right? Um, sure. Famously, during world wars, you see certain people who may not have the personality to be leadership. They they're sort of put into this position that they have to almost lead a nation. Um, and even more recently, there are some personalities out there because of what's going on in the world right now. They've had to become a different type of person. So circumstances also push them well, to, to also change and adapt. So I do believe it's a combination of both. Um, but it's interesting what you said in terms of the natural pecking order. If you're if you're the firstborn in a family of six. If you're the eldest child, you'll tend to potentially have more of a leadership role. Too. Sure. So, you know, you, you are yes, kind of born into definitely. it in a way. So um, there is definitely a mix of both. How would you describe yourself as a leader? Well, I, as a leader, I think, uh, yes, I've always wanted to onboard more people with me since I was a child. So that, again, I think is a trait of leadership. And... Uh, Yes, like convince people of my vision. Always had, always had ideas and visions, and and then that aptitude to actually onboard people in my vision. And you go out and do it. So that's the difference, yeah. right? So you not only but, do you but have I'll give you also like a bad example of okay, that good. when I was in that. middle school. Okay. So totally like bored to death and re-questioning the system, and uh, and then you know like it was a sunny day and I didn't want to go into class and then I was like thinking. Mm, what if I convince everyone to not go to class? Then they cannot punish all of us. Look at that. Look at and that little rebel. Like, exactly. Little rebel at school. And I started like actually explaining to them the concept. And I said, guys, like if we all don't show up, then they cannot punish you're, you're, all of yeah, us. You we just, you know, like, yeah. look like, oh, we didn't Dangerous know. Dangerous influence you know, that Exactly. <laughs> look at that. So, so, yeah. So when I think back of that. And why well, stop with the classroom? You should have done the whole school. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just totally. close down the school for, totally. for an entire month. If there month. was social media at that time, yeah, you would have maybe done it. I would have I, done I don't it. doubt it. I don't doubt it. That's yes. awesome. Time for one last ball. Yes. Come on. Let's see what we have in here. The last one. Okay. Confidence versus substance. Yeah. So... As, a, as someone who would, you know, you talked about you, you don't people to follow you. Is it more important to have the confidence in how you project yourself and your ideas? Or is it more important to actually have the substance to back yeah. it up? Well, I, I think for me, substance is important. But I do come from a North American um, background, training. And, and I think that what you learn there is confidence is a big piece because you also meet a lot of intellectuals with a lot of substance, like amazing people that I met, uh, you know, throughout my journey in Europe, in Africa, like people with a lot of wisdom, but they don't have the confidence. And, and I think substance is important because substance somehow gives you also the confidence is the base of your confidence you know but confidence is very very important yeah and and it's something that you can come and go i'm guessing quite quickly yeah so it's not something you if know, it's not based on substance yeah it, it yeah I, yeah and but also if someone says something to you unless you're a very strong person yeah. that confidence can be shattered sure and you, that self-doubt will creep mm-hmm. in so how do you as an individual as a person keep that co- that inner confidence yeah. I'll tell you, you and I'll also. Yes, yeah, you, haven't had, you haven't had me. You haven't Actually, had me. Yet. No, yeah. I'm going to have like. 
uh, blueberry okay. tea. Be authentic. Be <laughs> exactly. authentic. It's fine. So, so the thing is, uh, yes, and and I'm addressing myself to to the women listening to us. Please do. I I think my what drove my piece of confidence really applies to all the women. Uh, it's impact. I think impact is something that we have as women part of our DNA uh, to a certain level. And uh, w when you, you're building your life with confidence, you know, your, your ambition, being a doer, wanting to succeed in career, you will have people who will at some point, you know, tell you, oh, yeah, you're just, you know, like being selfish and, and you know, like you're just thinking of you in your career whatsoever. Uh, and, and in that moment, if you're a woman who creates impact and you can always do it throughout your own, like, career on the side, then it's in those moments that you're like, wait a minute, like, how am I selfish? I actually create impact. You know, I do this. I help kids. I, I help, you know, like, I don't know, my community and so on. So, so yes, yeah, so, so creating real impact will definitely give you an untouchable confidence yeah. <laughs> because, because you see it, you can measure it. Yeah. And the, the results, again, they feel, yes, they, they, they feel totally. you. Totally. Neza, it's been an, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you I, mm. I could honestly i could talk to you for such a long time um i think your stories are are inspirational i think you're an incredible uh, woman i think you're a great role model for so many people starting Thank with your you. kids they're very lucky mm. to have you and um I, I really sincerely wish you all the very best of luck with everything that you're doing because you are making a difference and it's great to see. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. An honor to be here today. Thank you so much. Mm. See you later. Thank you.